That's a very important uh, subject. As you, as you say, it's true that at the very beginning I was more interested in the construction of gender in architecture. But the question of collaborations became also very important. I was uh, thinking, for example, about how uh, Charles Perrian collaborated with uh, Le Corbusier, how Lily Roy collaborated with uh, Mies, and their work is uh, unthinkable without these uh, contributions. They were absolutely uh, very important. There is nothing, for example, in Mies architecture before they do the Exposition de la Mode, where they do these uh, suspended curtains. Uh, that uh, will announce the idea of these floating walls that become the paradigm of uh, Mies architecture. But if you look at the earlier work of Mies before his collaboration with, uh, with Lily Reich, it's very conservative. Uh, well, if you go to see these houses in, in Berlin for these bunkers, you know, they are perfectly nice, but they are very conservative. So you can say that they had a lot to do with their practice, but their position was never quite acknowledged. It's even more dramatic in the case of Margaret MacDonald, which collaborated, of course, with uh, Mackintosh, and nobody remembers now Margaret McDonald. But the poor Mackintosh, he spent his life saying, you know, I'm a normal guy. They wonder, he's a genius, he's far. And, <laughs> and, you know, at that time, apparently, they believe it, because I recently read a journal uh, that was published in, in Vienna at the turn of the century, 902, 903, uh, when they have designed the house for an art lover. And the usual keeps talking about this red hair that has arrived in Vienna and is the designer of this great house. And also her husband, Mackintosh, collaborated in the project, like he's the second. Uh, and then I don't know how in history we managed to uh, eliminate her place. And um, only, uh, if you ask now, a student he will only remember, knows perfectly well who Mackintosh is, has no idea who Margaret MacDonald is. So this is a, a very strange uh, thing in which in architecture we tend to privilege one person. Uh, and we eliminate all the people that are part of the process, not just women, but uh, sometimes also guys disappear from the credit. Uh, and uh, only in the mid-century you have these collaborations that are more recognized in, in the name, like uh, Charles and Ray Inch and uh, Alison and Peter Smith, so on, etc. Uh, but even in that moment, still they become in a secondary. So my position, so my position is, we have to understand, more than adding women to the history of architecture, we have to start understanding architecture as a collaborative practice, which it is, in which many people are involved in construction workers, uh, even uh, all these uh, uh, different... So it's closer in many ways to film production than to visual arts, and this privileging of the single figure is not uh, really a good idea for anybody in, in architecture. You know, for this book that I just finished, The X-ray Architecture, which is very much about the impact of uh, tuberculosis on modern architecture and the X-ray as a te technology of viewing, but actually goes to the present too with the CAT scan and the MRI and the impact that they have on the so-called uh, digital generation of the, of the 90s. But I went back historically, and this is the interesting thing. From the very beginning, from the very beginning of architectural theory, Vitruvius, mm -hmm. Vitruvius says that every architect should also study medicine. Yeah, as if we didn't have enough to study architecture, now we have to study medicine too, because uh, healthfulness is our main object, right? And uh, it's very interesting as Renaissance schools of design were for the first time established in Florence in the, in the 1500s. Uh, they placed themselves next to the medical uh, schools, and actually attending dissection was a requirement of all design students. And we're going to the local hospital uh, near the Academia del Diseño, Santa Maria Nuova, or something in Florence, uh, where they were supposed to uh, draw the body as it decomposed, even if for days on end. Uh, of course, there was no refrigeration, <laughs> and there were reports of, of students vomiting and getting sick, and professors getting sick, and everybody's getting sick, but nevertheless, they were supposed to be there drawing this uh, dissected, uh, decomposing uh, body. So this relationship between architecture and medicine has been there from the very beginning, and you can say that today, uh, contemporary ideas of design are also uh, very much impacted by ideas of health in our time. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the modern, of course, tuberculosis was the main obsession of that um, of that period, and uh, it's, uh, it has an enormous impact on on architecture. So it's not that modern architects design sanatoriums; it's that sanatoriums were already modern 
<laughs> and this prescription for a healthy body that came from uh, uh, from collaborations, actually very close collaborations between architects and doctors at the turn of the century, uh, that is uh, open windows, white walls, ventilation, air, sun, terrace, etc., became, of course, uh, uh, the recipe for uh, modern architecture. So many, mo many architects uh, did their first modern building uh, as an attorney. And I talked uh, yesterday in the talk about Arto. Arto was a perfectly neoclassic architect until he entered a competition for a sanatorium and all of a sudden his first modern uh, project emerged and the next uh, project realized, which is Paimio, which is of course totally modern. So he became modern because of tuberculosis, because of the sanatorium. And he himself had been very sick at the time of the commission. So this idea that the uh, body of the architect also has a part, I think is also very, very fascinating. From this aspect, what interests me more is the way in which uh, the internet and social media has actually changed the spaces in which we live. And in particular, I was focusing uh, yesterday and I have been focusing for a while on the question of the bed. And the bed came totally by chance to me, reading a newspaper article in the Wall Street Journal, actually quite by chance. An article that said that in the business section that 85, 85% of young professionals in New York were working in bed and working in Working in bed, 85%, 85% is not a lot of bed. And at the same time, you know, articles that have been reporting about how all these office buildings in Manhattan were kind of half empty in the middle of the recession. So I thought, I thought to myself, so we are living in outdated cities, right? We still think about the city of a city of living and here is the offices or the factories or the places of work. But in fact, Less and less people are having now a nine to five uh, job. Less and less people are using a traditional office. There is the proliferation of this new kind of uh, working spaces like WeWork or you name it, uh, in which uh, uh, there is a completely different uh, relationship uh, between uh, the space of work and, and the space of uh, living. And also very significant is the question of the bed for me because uh, everybody at, at, in the end has a, has a bed, so it's definitely a total dia, <laughs> which is the theme of this Biennale, the everyday uh, question. And this bed is now a more public space than it ever was, because even when you think you're not working, of course many people work in bed, they Skype in China, with China in the middle of the night, or, uh, or with Europe or whatever, because of the different times, uh, differences, and because also they are not just working in the same city where you are living, but you can be working all over uh, the world and with the technology. But also when you think you're not working, you're lying in bed there, relaxing or making a trip to, I don't know where, to Jamaica for your holidays, you're working because you're producing data. So this which is monetized, etc. Et so it's a different kind of work. So what is the nature of work in our time? What is the nature of private space? What is public and what is private is once again changed in, in the same way that it changed at the beginning of the century with the arrival of photography and uh, film and the illustrated architectural magazine, etc. So what I had studied earlier on in my career of privacy and publicity um, in, in, in modern architecture, now it becomes uh, the question of privacy and publicity in the age of social media, because the same question, so what is private and what is public, continue to interest. The prediction could be quite dystopic, and I agree with you. It's a very, very tough situation for many, many uh, people. We and from there a lot of other kind of disorders uh, like burnout uh, syndrome and so many others. We now work continuously. I feel myself like I work much harder than than 20 years ago. I'm constantly working wherever it's. I don't care anymore whether it's a weekend or a, or a summer or a vacation or I don't know what. It seems to continuously uh, working. So we all become like a these uh, uh, machines, and of course, uh, uh, with industrialization, of course, eventually, uh, through um, pushback and protest, there were regulations, the eight-hour uh, work day, the vacation, the rights for, for the workers, the unions, etc. We still are uh, in the very beginning of this new economy, and nothing is in place yet, and I'm sure something else will have uh, to happen. Right? There are also, as I mentioned yesterday in the lecture, uh, many predictions about the end of uh, human labor as we know it. Of 
for several things will continue to exist, like uh, education. But many, uh, many, many, many people are going to be replaced by uh, by machines, by robots, etc. So this is also something that we have to 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 consider. Economists are taking this very seriously. Politicians are taking it seriously. There are experiments all over the place, uh, from Finland to California, of um, uh, of giving money to entire communities to see what people do when they don't have to work uh, for money, because we don't have any idea. The basic universal basic income was voted in Switzerland uh, a couple of years ago and rejected. But the fact that it came to a vote make us it should make us think that this is this is coming. So all of this has consequences for architects. We are not all working uh, nine to five in a particular place. Okay, then this uh, it should uh, we look very different in a in a few years. And it's for us architects to take this seriously instead of uh, denying what is actually happening. You go to many schools of architecture; they still will give an office building as a project as if nothing will happen. <laughs> so like, okay, we know don't worry about that way. Right? Who is doing all this uh, this new kinds of space of uh, of work. I, I hear recently Robert Stern uh, telling someone that he has two people in his office he is dedicated only to working for, for rigor. So some architects are taking it seriously. Shouldn't we take it more in terms of rethinking uh, uh, in the schools as, uh, and as uh, architects the question of how we live in our times? Precisely as you were saying, to make it more less dystopic, <laughs> and, uh, and to and to and to of course engage with uh, these new conditions because there is no way of uh, of denying it. We don't have that much power, no matter much how much architects always think they can change everything, but we can change very little. But there are certain things that can still change and that can make life uh, uh, better. <laughs>